those of us that have been working the last two weeks in advertising and promotion have sometimes felt as if we've been thrown out in the left field. Because a lot of what's been said here just doesn't seem to pertain to advertising and promotion. We've been called the black sheep of this workshop even. And yet, I think most of us would disagree that that's true. High school publications have developed so much in the last 50 or 60 years that they are now really big business. For example, it's estimated that last year over $75 million was spent on the publication of yearbooks alone. Over $75 million. And so you see, you're running a business and you're part of a very large industry. No matter what size your yearbook is, you're still going to be concerned with a business operation because you're going to have expenses, you're going to take in some money, we hope, and you're going to have to keep some records. Just as good content in your book is important, your sound financial basis is also equally important. Because if you can't publish a book and stay out of debt, you're not going to be in business very long. And there's nothing that makes a school administrator any more upset than to have a school publication that's always floundering and looking for money. Now, to achieve this business success, there are four points that you need to consider. First of all, and most important of all, you have to have a financial plan. You can't just go at this at a very haphazard method. Now, there's some things that ought to be said about this plan. It must be workable. If you don't understand it, it's not going to do you any good. We said you're going to have to use records and systems, all right? These bookkeeping methods have to be simple, too, because most of us are not trained accountants. <coughs> Hopefully, you'll be able to add and subtract, however. Now then, you've got some systems and records set up. What do you do with them? Well, you ought to be making monthly reports to your advisor and to your editor, especially with a yearbook where you're handling large sums of money. Don't just assume that everything's going to come out all right in the end, because sometimes it doesn't. For instance, one school spent about the last two days chasing around seven or eight hundred dollars that they just simply couldn't find somewhere. And you know, at the end of the year, the day of reckoning comes because you have to turn in all those records and accounts to the school's office or the school treasurer or whoever's in charge of it, and your books have to match with theirs. And you know, theirs are always right. So you've got to hunt around and make sure yours balance with theirs. All right, and then last of all, this financial plan ought to be planned for the entire year. Don't expect to find a pot of gold in January to take you over the rest of the year. It just doesn't happen. This plan ought to be completed before you ever leave school in the spring. Don't wait until next fall to start getting organized. Now, of course, some of you say, oh, but we haven't started yet. Well, all right, fine. But next spring, you'll know what you're doing, and you can get next year's staff off to a better start, you see. Now, part of this financial plan is your budget. And you think, oh, dear, budgets. Well, it's there for a purpose, and it's there for you to live by. This is your guideline. The budget is also for you business people to try and keep some of these hot-headed and dreamy-eyed editors here in a state of reality. You've got to keep their feet on the ground because if for some reason your editor decides, my, wouldn't color look nice on every page? Well, yes, it would. But does your budget have the money to support it? You're the one that's going to have to be realistic, perhaps, and remind them, now look, maybe we'd like to put out a $10,000 yearbook, but we've only got $1,200. Your school administrator might be a little upset if you tried it. Now then, just how in the world do you plan a budget? Most of us have trouble making ends meet from week to week. What are you going to do when you're working with two to five to ten thousand dollars? 
Well, first of all, you've got to be practical and realistic about the whole thing. And so, here are five steps to get you a realistic, practical type budget. Number one, estimate, and here's that word again, realistically, be honest with yourself. Estimate the sources of all income. And once you list these sources, divide them up and estimate the amount you can expect from each source. For instance, if the PTA always gives you $100, list that. If you can always expect to sell $1,000 worth of subscriptions, you add that in too. So you estimate each point and then total them. Step two, estimate very carefully every probable expense. And this is where you may get into trouble. Be sure you include everything. And we'll talk a little bit later on what everything might include. And then number three, to your estimated expenses, add 10%. This is a reserve fund. And it can be very, very important for you. For instance, what happens if you sell all of this advertising, but you can't collect on half of it? How are you going to pay for your book? Well, if you've added a little cushion, you see, to your budget, you're not going to be in too much trouble. Or what happens if one of your photographers drops the camera in the lake, you see? Perhaps you'll need to buy some new equipment. What happens if the first day of September, perhaps, you get this enormous bill from one of your photographers or from an engraver. How are you going to pay for it? You haven't sold that first subscription yet. Well, you should have, you see, this money left over from the previous year. And then you can take care of it and you're not going to have creditors beating down your door. Now, the last step, or pardon me, the next to the last step in planning your budget is to compare the two figures, number one and number three your income and your expenses plus the 10 percent. And now this is the tough part. These two must equal. Your income could exceed your expenses, but be careful, maybe you're not really being honest. And then last of all, you've got to get this budget approved. Probably it will have to be approved by your advisor and your principal. In some school situations, you also have to take it to the student council, the school board, and anybody else who'd like to look it over. Well, that's all right, because this is public business, and it's big business, and it's a lot of money. And so you've got to be open and honest about it, so you might as well show it to everyone who wants to see it. All right? Now then, you've estimated your income, and we said we'd talk about where in the world this income is going to come from. Well, there are three major sources, generally speaking. Chances are your school won't use all three, but will use a combination of them in some kind of arrangement. First of all, we have subscription sales. And we'll talk a little bit later how to get the book sold. Secondly is advertising. And third, subsidies. Now lots of people have mixed emotions about subsidy. And this is, you know, where you receive an outright gift or money from the school. Lots of times this is beneficial. It's not, that, it's not indicating at all that you don't know how to run a business. But a subsidy merely guarantees that you're not going to go in the red. It perhaps allows you to charge a lower price to your students. Therefore, more of your students can buy your book. After all, how many of you think you could sell, say, a $10 book to all of your students. And yet, if the book is going to cost you that much, perhaps you'd better get a subsidy from somewhere. Or perhaps it's going to allow you to lower your, lower your advertising rate. Because if you're charging, say, $200 for a full-page ad in your book, you're probably not going to sell too many full-page ads. However, I think for our purposes, we'll talk mostly about advertising and subscription as the two major sources of income for you.
There are some other ways that you can get some money, and if you can't meet your budget by using just sales and advertising, here are 10 little things you might try, perhaps. However, I have a few personal reservations about all these. I think your job as a yearbook editor or business manager is to put out a yearbook. I don't think your job is to run car washes and bake sales and rummage sales and what have you. To put out the kind of book you want, you're going to have to be pretty busy all of the time working on the yearbook. You don't have time to do any moonlighting. But just in case you do, or if you have some freshmen that are pretty eager and don't have too much to do on the book, maybe they can go scrape together a little more money. So here's some, some things you might try. Number one, you can charge each senior a fee to have his picture in the book. This fee ranges anywhere from about a dollar to maybe two or three dollars. Secondly, you could charge each organization a flat rate to be included in your book. This is a rather common practice among college and, and university yearbooks, and in many of your high schools you'll find it also. It ranges anywhere from, say, $10 in high school up to maybe $75 for a full page in a college book. However, there's one pitfall here, and this is the fact that be sure that just because an organization can pay to have a full page in your yearbook, be sure they're really worth it. If they've only got 10 members, can you justify giving them a whole page and then only giving, say, Booster Club half a page when they've got 250 members but just didn't want to spend the money for, your, for the picture in your book? So you have to consider this. It's your decision to make. You're the one who decides what kind of coverage you're going to give to people in your book. Don't let a nice fat treasury decide it for you. And number three. This one I think sounds pretty good. Get your senior pictures free from your photographer because you promise to give him the contract for photographing all of your seniors. Now I think we're all well aware that seniors just don't go in and get one picture taken for the yearbook and that's it. You know they have to buy about half a dozen eight by tens and a colored picture and couple hundred little billfold size to hand out to the whole school and this sort of thing. And that usually runs up to a pretty nice bill. So don't kid yourself, that photographer can easily afford to give you the picture that you need for your yearbook because he's going to be making a nice tidy profit all of those other, off of all of those other pictures that he's selling. Number four, another source of income you might try is to sell plastic covers for your yearbook. These run anywhere from 25 to 50 cents. If you have a light colored cover, these go very easily. You make not a whole lot off of them, but a little. Number five, at the end of the year, how about selling all of those pictures that you didn't use in your book? You ought to have boxes and boxes of them left. If you have eight by 10 glosses, you can usually sell those for a dollar a piece. And five by sevens can go, most generally, for 75 cents. Just be sure that you've got lots of staff people around that table to make sure people aren't, you know, picking them up by the handfuls and then slipping quietly out. But it's an easy source of income because what would you do with all those pictures anyway? Number six. This is one that if you've got a large staff and not much work to do, you might try. Sell magazine subscriptions. Some books have made over several thousand dollars by selling magazine subscriptions. Number seven, check on this early in the year as soon as you sign your contract with your company because sometimes you get discounts for meeting your deadlines extremely early or if you pay all of your printing costs early and pay them in full. Lots of times they'll give you a small discount. So discounts from your printing company but don't count on it, you know, because lots of times things happen. So don't put it in your budget. Number eight, you might run the concession stand at basketball and football games if you have nothing else to do. Although I'd rather see you out taking pictures of what's going on and getting some ideas for layouts and copy and this sort of thing. 
But here again, you can make a lot of money without a whole lot of work. You might also run the check room at a basketball game. If you say, oh, but such and such club in our school has that all sewed up, well, maybe you can sweet talk them into renting it to you for one night and you give them a small cut, you see, from the profit that you make. Another source of income be number nine, out and out donations. These might come from alumni associations in your town, perhaps a letterman's club, or dad's club or mother's club, perhaps from the PTA, or even perhaps from your student council. Once again, don't count on this sort of thing because sometimes they're pretty finicky and pretty fickle too. Number 10, you might try some kind of entertainment. For instance, you might run a beauty contest or a talent contest or a queen contest and select the queen of your 1967 yearbook. You might also run a carnival or sponsor the dances after football and basketball games. Or I believe one school here had a Sadie Hawkins dance that went over real well and really cleaned up on the money. If you can get a unique idea and give it a new twist, you're bound to be a success. You might also sponsor a student faculty basketball game. This is always pretty good for a laugh. You might sponsor concerts. One school, I believe, sponsored the Letterman once. That ought to go over pretty well in your school. Or a variety show, or just all sorts of things, if you just stop and think. A good time to do this is in the late spring, you know, right after basketball season's over and there's this big letdown and not much to do and everybody's bored and it's not prime time yet and hopefully all your book has gone to the printer unless you have fall delivery. So this might be a good time to get together and raise a little money for next year, you see. Get a head start. Now, how are you going to save some money so that maybe you don't have to do all this extracurricular activity? Well, here's some ideas that might help you save a little money in your budget. First of all, and this is most important, start, underline it, do something different with it. Keep accurate, detailed records. Be sure you record every time you spend a dime. And for heaven's sakes, learn how to add and subtract. I say that because I can't do it and I don't want you to get in the same trouble I'm usually in. Number two, be careful when you purchase your supplies. If you purchase in large quantities, especially photography supplies and things like this, you can usually save money. Also check in and see if the school doesn't get a discount at many of these places and take advantage of it if they do. Number three, Watch the darkroom supplies very carefully. You know, it's awfully tempting for a student photographer to go in and just make up a few extra prints for himself. Well, maybe once, you see, wouldn't hurt, but if it becomes a general practice or if he's got a little business going here on the side doing photography work for somebody else, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Number four, establish inflexible purchasing rules. Make sure that you have to have the purchasing permission in writing. And then number five goes along with this. Don't ever pay back anyone who made an unauthorized purchase. Because if they do it once and you don't pay them back, they probably won't try it again. Number six, charge most of your purchases and then pay for them by check. This helps you to keep your accurate records that we talked about before. And if you have a petty cash fund, be sure that you count every penny. Every time you take 10 cents out to buy stamps, put in a little note, a little receipt. And by the way, that petty cash fund shouldn't be open to just everybody on your staff. It's awfully handy to go in and buy yourself a Coke that way. Number seven. If you really get into trouble, ask your company representative for help if he has any ideas. 
because after all, he's supposed to be an expert in this field and he ought to know all of the answers. Number eight, choose a cover that fits the needs and the budget of your school. A padded cover with lots of embossing and things like this is really a luxury and one that most of us can't afford. Number nine, if you can gain cuts whenever possible, you can save money. If you can treat a large group of pictures as one unit, you can save money when you send it to the engraver. Number 10, limit the list of your complimentary copies. If you give a free copy of your book to everybody and his brother, you're going to be throwing away anywhere from 100 to 700 to 1000 dollars a year. Because if you figure your book costs five dollars a piece and you give away a hundred copies, there's five hundred dollars down the drain. Now a good idea and a good public relations gimmick is to give every advertiser a free copy of your book. However, you know that that book really isn't free. That five dollars for your book was included in the price that he paid for his advertising. But he doesn't have to realize that, you see. All right, number 11. You know, if you have an out-of-town printer, every time you ship off some pages to him, it's going to cost you money. Be sure that you keep track of it so that you're ready for it. So that the next year you can allow 10 or $15 or whatever for postage. And you know, if you get into trouble, those long-distance phone calls are going to cost you money too, so you better allow for them in your budget. Moral of the story is, you know, don't get into trouble and don't call the, the company long distance if you can help it. And the next one, be careful of office supplies. Make sure that people aren't writing their term papers on your copy paper, for instance. That's there for office use. Make sure that pica rulers and grease pencils and things don't end up floating up and down the halls. I know it's hard to do. And, it happens in the best of families. However, keep a careful eye on your office. And the last point to remember is the fact that when you conduct a sales campaign or an advertising <coughs> campaign, it's going to cost you some money. Perhaps you'll want to buy an ad in your school newspaper. Or somebody's going to have to pay, you see, for that poster paper and paint and things like this. We'll include that in your budget, too. It shouldn't have to come from somebody's pocket. Now then, to get to the heart of the matter in advertising. For some reason, a lot of administration people and a lot of merchants feel that advertising a student publication is just simply a gift and a donation. And there's nothing that makes me any mad or any quicker than to have somebody tell me this, because it just simply isn't true, provided that you people come through and do your part of the job. Advertising in a school publication ought to be written and it ought to be geared just like commercial advertising. We'll talk about some of the things that you ought to be doing for it. If your community is reluctant to purchase advertising in your book, or perhaps your administration isn't too eager to let you sell advertising, here are some things that you might tell them to convince them that you're doing everybody a worthwhile service. Number one, and this is ought to be obvious to all of you after being up here for two weeks, students do spend money. It's estimated that teenagers alone spend anywhere from two to seven billion, that's not million, but that's billion, two to seven billion dollars a year. Didn't know you were so rich, did you? You might figure on about six hundred dollars per student per year. And that might be a little conservative. If you remember, last week we conducted a market survey here, and that'll be out for you tomorrow that you can take back to your school to see just what a representative sampling of about 90 teenagers spend and how they spend all of their money. You might use that. Or better yet, conduct one of your own in your own school. All right, the second point you might tell them is the fact that Young people are forming the buying habits now that will stay with them all the rest of their life. 
So a good idea, you see, is to build goodwill for the future. Now certainly I don't think any of us could argue that yearbook advertising is used like the yellow pages in your phone book. If you want to find a restaurant, you probably aren't going to go and look in your yearbook to find, an adver to find a restaurant to go eat at. But still, you're going to be building goodwill. The third point you can tell them is that students, and you may not believe this, but I think it's true, students do influence their parents on what they buy. This is especially true for things like cars, gifts, furniture, recreation and vacation equipment. Notice most of those are pretty large items that entail rather large sum of money. Number four, student publications, both the newspaper and yearbook, are the only media that really reach the student market effectively because they are geared to the student and to the teenager. Number five, Roughly 75% of all parents read a student publication. Or you might figure that for every yearbook you sell, we'll say you sell a thousand books in your school, you probably have a readership of closer to 5,000 for your yearbook. And that's a pretty large market. You know how it is when you take your yearbook home that first day. Do you ever get a chance to look at it? Or does your mother grab it out of your hot little hand and sit down to go through it first? And number six, because this is a select group and it's known, you can gear your ads directly to teenagers. And therefore, the advertiser is going to get more for his money. He's not going to be wasting it on commercial newspaper advertising, you know, that's buried back in the back page on about page 49 or something that you'll never see. And number seven, this is obvious, yearbooks are permanent. In fact, there are many cases where the yearbook ad far outlasts the business itself. And so this idea of permanency is another good selling point. Now, these are some reasons why someone ought to buy advertising in your publication. But just how much are you going to charge him? Well, here's some guidelines. We can't say definitely that you ought to be charging $50 for a full page ad. But here are some things you might consider and then go back and look at your advertising rate. And if you as editors don't know how much it costs to advertise in your book, you better find out. All right, a desirable scale for advertising offers the merchant a discount, really, for buying a larger ad. For example, if you charge $100 for a full page ad, and I'm using this because my math is pretty poor, but if you charge $100 for a full page ad, a half a page ad should cost about 60% of that, or $60. And a quarter page ad ought to be about $35. And an eighth of a page $20. You see the percentage is there, 60, 35, and 20. Don't just keep cutting them in half because you're going to be losing money. Now remember, the more quarter and third or half page ads you can sell with this kind of advertising rate, the more money you're really going to be making. Because if you sell two half page ads, you're getting $120 from that page, not just 100 you see. Now this, I'm not advocating that you sell a lot of little teensy tiny ads because you should probably never sell anything smaller than an eighth of a page or a sixth of a page ad. If you do, they just can't say anything. They're just too small, especially if you have a seven and three quarters book and if you divide that up, you see, into eighth of pages or sixth of pages and so on, there just isn't any room there. Now, if you're carrying pictures in your ad section, you should never put a picture in an ad that's less than a quarter of a page. You try to get a picture to fit in one-sixth of a page. It just doesn't go, and it just doesn't look attractive. Something else you can use as a guide in setting your advertising rate is to remember that that ad ought to pay for itself, or the page that it's printed on, 
plus one other. So if it costs you $40 to have one page of your book printed, then your ad, a full page ad, ought to cost $80 to pay for itself plus one other. Okay? Then you also have to consider how much it's going to cost you to get the book printed, the kind of school you're in. If you're in a relatively well-to-do area, you can probably get $100 a page. If you're not, if you're in a rural community where there isn't too much business to draw from anyway, you might only be able to get, say, $30 for a full page ad. So you have to consider that. And also you need to consider your competition. If you're from a large city like Indianapolis or Fort Wayne, remember there are going to be a lot of other schools going to the very same people you are and asking for $100. Chances are they, none of you may get it. Okay, how to sell the ad then, quickly. You have to plan ahead and sell early. Try to beat your competition. The best time to sell your ads is during the summer when you have nothing else to do. But before you can go out and sell an ad, you've got to have a staff and they've got to be well trained. Remember, you're conducting a business and when these people go in to sell an ad, they ought to be ready to conduct business. You ought to be dressed neatly, throw out your gum on the way into the, into the store, ask for the business manager or the person in charge, and if you can possibly ask for them by name, this is even better. Have with you a contract ready for them to sign, and that's in duplicate, remember, so that you get a copy and he gets a copy. If you can, have your yearbook with you and show him how his ad looked in the previous year's book. If you have any other free little gifts to give him, do it at this time. But for heaven's sakes, don't beg him to advertise. If for some reason he's got his dander up and he doesn't want any part of yearbook advertising, don't beg and plead and say, oh, please, support our school. You know, this is the civic thing to do. You don't need his ad. You're going to find plenty of others. Be sure that you have pictures scheduled and plenty of time if you're using them in your ad section. You know how photographers are, sometimes they're a little bit forgetful and disorganized. So be sure that you go with them. Don't expect him, or the photographers, to remember to get the names of all the people in the picture. You'd better do it yourself. And be ready with lots of ideas, in case he happens to draw a blank that particular day. I think every pay, or pardon me, every book could include a professional page. Most of you can't and won't ask a doctor to buy, for instance, a full page ad in your book. But a professional directory at the back of your book is perfectly all right, where you list doctors, lawyers, this sort of thing. If you have shopping centers in your area, you can certainly sell one large page or possibly two and then list them all together give them one big spread you see instead of li little bitty ads from each one of them there's no excuse for a yearbook staff to accept a charity ad you have to insist that your ad is doing a selling job for the merchant there's no justification whatsoever for an ad that simply says compliments of a friend. You wouldn't find that in a commercial paper or a magazine and you shouldn't find it in your book. So-called ads are simply a disgrace to your book and they don't do anything for the merchant or you. If that's all he wants to do then just ask him, well then would you just please give us the donation and then you list it on your income tax as such. Because if that's what you consider it, a gift, then we might as well be honest with each other. You don't need to ruin your book with something like that. Your ad section can be one of the most interesting and readable sections in your book. And then some of you are probably thinking, mm-hmm, sure it is. Well, I have a couple examples here I'd like to show you. First of all, let me point out that the trend today in advertising in yearbooks is to using pictures with your ads. However, there's a catch. That doesn't mean just any old picture that you couldn't fit in any place else in your book, you can stick back in the ad section. No, it doesn't work that way because it's not very interesting. For instance, I don't know if any of you can see this one. 
There's several examples here. For instance, first of all, look at the very small ad on the page. No pictures in any of them. You say, oh, but down here's a picture. Well, yes, here are three girls. It looks like it was taken at IU. No names, no nothing. Has absolutely nothing to do with the furniture store or the Phillips 66 gas station that I can see. Or how about this, one of those little childhood snapshot pictures? What that has to do with Burnside's garage, I haven't quite figured out yet either. Notice, too, that these ads bleed all the way off the page, all around. Your ad section ought to observe the same margins as the rest of your book, and it ought to include page numbers, too. Here's another example. A little bit larger ad, perhaps, but still the same unrelated picture. Surely you can do better than this. Now, some small ads can be rather attractive because you can use artwork in them. If you use large, heavy type that's interesting, and if they're laid out with some thought and care, a small book and small ad can be rather nicely done. But once again, don't just expect it to happen overnight. Notice again what you can do, you see, with a quarter page ad, you can get a rather small picture. Perhaps this could have been enlarged a little bit. <coughs> now, for a larger book, you might create a little different kind of personality. I'm showing you this one because I've been fascinated with it all year. Here's an example of, I don't know what kind of snow job they did on Coke, but there's a two-page ad from Coca-Cola. Now, if you people aren't getting even a half page from Coke, you're missing the boat because they'll buy two in this book. I'm sure they'll buy half a page or more in yours. There's a two-page ad from Coca-Cola. Now, if you people aren't getting even a half page from Coke, you're missing the boat because they'll buy two in this book. I'm sure they'll buy half a page or more in yours. Notice here some picture advertising with students and the students are identified because students ought to be listed in your book in the index. Your advertisers ought to be listed in your index, either all lumped together or in a special advertiser's index. Now, that was a rather plain section if you noticed. Let me show you this particular book. This is an ad section. This is the first double page spread of the advertising section. If you'll notice, they're using tint blocks, which you can use because they don't cost you anything. Or pardon me, not tint blocks, but screens. They're using headlines and body copy and students in the pictures. All of this you can do <coughs> too. Now you say, oh, those are full page ads. Here are pages with quarter page ads. And they're interesting. The copy is probably some of the liveliest in the entire book. And if you know these students, and you would if you've gone to school with them all year, you'll find this is really interesting. This is the kind of thing you'll sit down and read during the summer and enjoy. That's another selling point to your merchant. And then there's one other kind. This is the ad section with a rather uncluttered look. And it's very attractive, very easy to read, and probably has a very high readership. This particular book doesn't sell anything smaller than a third of a page. Perhaps that might be a good idea for you, or nothing smaller than a quarter page. Every ad has a picture. <coughs> every picture has students in it. And every student is identified. The copy is not as bulky as it was in the other one we just looked at, but it's interesting and it's easy to read. <coughs> now, in selling your book, and we're going to have to really condense this, but quickly. To sell your book, first of all, it has to be a saleable book, and that's the job of you people who are editors. You can't expect your advertising or your sales staff to work miracles. 
However, they should set themselves a reasonable goal. And a reasonable goal for sales in your school is at least 85%. So if you have a thousand students in your school and you're only selling a hundred books, somebody's missing the boat. All right, secondly, your book must be priced reasonably. The more books you sell, the cheaper it is to produce each copy of the book. Therefore, if you sell a lot of books, perhaps you can lower your subscription price. All right, you should consider then how much advertising you can sell, because remember, that's one source of income. You have to consider how much money the average student in your school has to spend. If they're pretty well off, say they get about $20 a week spending money, then you ought to be able to sell them a $10 book. However, if they're like most of the rest of us, don't expect it. You have to consider the book in relationship to other school activities. If, for instance, you're being asked to spend money every time you turn around, they may resent you coming to them to, to sell a book. Would perhaps, and this is an important question, would perhaps lowering, lowering your price mean that you could sell more books in the long run? and therefore maybe making a larger profit. And here's a little point that you ought to remember and take back to your advisors if they're not aware of it. You must pay 2% Indiana sales tax on your books. There's been, it's been debated, it's been argued about, there have been different rulings, but as it stands now, every book you sell, you must charge 2% sales tax. Now an easy way to do that, for instance, if you sell a book for 450, sell it for 450 but when the student comes to pick up his book in the spring charge him a dime sales tax and you just put that in the kitty you see most kids will have a dime rattling around their pocket they can pay to get the book that way you kept your tax money separate and so on and then it's already sent into the state when the time comes your campaign ought to be conducted early while people still have money it ought to be concentrated into one or two weeks. Don't drag it out from the 1st of October until the middle of January. Set up some kind of competitive system between homerooms or between classes. Keep the results posted. And offer some kind of prize or reward to the homeroom getting 100% sales first or something like this. Be sure that every student gets a receipt when he buys a book. Be sure that you have a receipt. There's nothing more embarrassing than to have a student come in in the spring and say, I want my yearbook, and you think, well, how nice, and there's no receipt. Don't panic. You might begin your sales campaign with some kind of convocation. You can have a political campaign type thing. You can have a talent show, variety show, maybe even a movie. Provide, however, some way that students who come into your school in the middle of the year or if you have freshmen entering at second semester, provide some way that they can order books. Be sure, too, that you talk to every faculty member and get them to purchase a book. Be sure that you have receipts for everything. Don't order extra books if you can help it, at least not many, because leftover books have absolutely no value except a scrap paper. And if you've got a lot of storage space and want a lot of scrap paper, fine. Be sure that for both this and advertising, you have a complete system of records and that you're accurate and neat. So this completes the tour of left field, the rest of you. And we'll see you tomorrow when we talk about getting your book from the dummy to the finished product. <laughs>